Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second week of Advent. Today, we're going to light the second candle. Last week, we lit the first candle, which was the prophet's candle. We talked about the prophecy of the coming Savior. And this week, we're going to light the Bethlehem candle. And maybe. And the Bethlehem candle is a reminder to us of the coming of our Savior and what I like to refer to as the bread of life, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather together and worship you. Thank you, Lord, that in spite of all the technological issues that we've had to deal with here, we've been able to bring things together in a way that we can still share and experience uh, your word. But more importantly, Lord, than all of that is the, the blessing of experiencing your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Advent and the birth of our Savior. And God, I just pray your blessing upon this word in our time together today. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, last week we lit the um, the uh, shepherd, uh, the prophet's candle. This week it's the Bethlehem candle. It is a symbol of the preparation being made to receive um, the Christ child. And uh, we're going to talk about Bethlehem this morning. So let's begin, first of all, in Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, uh, verses 1 through 7. It says, Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, to the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Also, John 6.35 shares something with us that I would like to share this morning. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, who has come, uh, who, he who comes to me, and he who believes in me will never thirst. You see, last week, or this week, we look at the little town of Bethlehem. And uh, in doing so, we consider the journey that Mary and Joseph took, of course, to this little city for the purpose, for their purpose, which was the birth of their son, or for the census, and resulted in the birth of their son. And um, you need to leave that where it's at. Those are my notes. I'm sorry, I just really figured this week. Um, so, uh, but also it's our journey, our journey to um, to understand and to to experience the fullness of the Savior. It was in the town of Bethlehem that we are presented with the gospel birth of Jesus. It was here in a manger that our Lord and Savior was born. The word Bethlehem comes to us through the combining of two Hebrew words, Bet, which can be translated house or place, and lehem, which means bread. Thus, the word Bethlehem can be translated house of bread. Bethlehem itself as a city does not hold a place of prominence within um, the Hebrew scriptures. We don't see a lot about it. And so um, we want to kind of get an idea of its, its lack of significance, its lack of importance. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share a verse now from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Micah says, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, uh, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you one will go forth for me, to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Notice that Micah refers to Bethlehem as a clan that is too little from the house of Judah. It's this little village that just kind of seems to exist in obscurity. Yet with this in mind, it seems only fitting that God would choose such a place for the birth of his son. God's not about the flashy, is he? He's about the, 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 the down-to-earth, I guess because he created the earth, and down to basics. We, we, we seek sometimes for the flashy or the exciting, but God is all about the basics. He begins with the basics. I think he begins with the basics with us as well. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you think of yourself necessarily as being overly flashy, but I personally, you know, I, I, you know, I wear a tie at Christmas, but uh, it's not a flashy one. It does have a 
a thing here that plays music if the batteries are dead. That would make it more flashy, right, if it did. So I'm not going to play music for you. Um, but we do see that in Bethlehem, Michael's prophecy, Micah's prophecy is fulfilled. The gospel writers are very clear to make this point. Yet not much else can be said about the village. However, what we do find is that from the house of bread, Bethlehem, we are given the bread of life, Jesus Christ. And it is his self-designation which Jesus places up upon him. As I read in uh, John 6, I'll read again here, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And what it's a wonderful thought when you think about it, that the bread of life came in order that our spirit may never hunger or thirst again for the things of God. From the most insignificant of places comes the most precious of not just for a newborn infant, but for all who take partake in the bread of life. And again, my tie this morning has gifts on it because I want to remind each of us that, you know, we are all about gift giving at Christmas, right? Um, in, in, our, in our house, in our family, uh, the, the message goes out sometime in November. I need a list. I need a list. I need a list. Now, why do I do it three times? Because they never respond on the first one rarely respond to the second one, but when mom sends out that third, I need a list, they know she needs a list, right? Because if not, it's a gift card. And of course, today, who cares? Everybody's about gift cards. They, they don't mind, and those are better if you can just drop through them. But, uh, but the idea here, you know, of gift giving, and on that first Christmas, that first Advent, that, that, that birth of our Savior, God gave us his most precious gift. As I mentioned this last week, wrapped in cloths, not wrapped in, in paper with bows, but wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. What a wonderful gift. And I, I, I just don't want us to lose the, the significance or the importance of this this year. Um, the, the idea here that God has, he, by sending his son, he's given us the most precious thing he could possibly give. So what does this mean then? How, how does, what's the difference here? I want to talk about this bread of life, really. That's what I want to focus on. That our, our, our spirits will never hunger or thirst again for God. And so let's take a look at this here. And the first thing I want us to understand is the concept of bread. I love bread. Okay? I like bread of all kinds. I like it with peanut butter and jelly. I like, you know, sandwiches or... I love lunch meat that doesn't love me, right? Uh, that kind of thing here because of we're going to watch what we got to eat. But bread is a staple. It is something that we all need. And there is a bread that sustains life. And we, we, you know, we need that. We need the grains, the, those things that make up bread, those things that, you know, that, that we can eat. And, uh, we were talking yesterday and... Uh, um, we were talking about, after we left here, we were talking about what we wanted to eat. I like soup, which is bread, but I like soup. But, uh, and, and then he says, well, what are you kind of hungry for? And I'm like, I always like bean soup. I don't know why, but bean soup is, I don't care how you make it. You can be beans and chili, beans and beans with ham, or beans, whatever, just bean soup. Um, and you know what's really good with soup? Bread, right? Just a piece of butter bread, you know, like that. Now for a brief musical interview. <laughs> the Spotify song still up. There you go. <laughs> you roll with it. When you have technological changes, you just roll with it, right? We're good. So, but the idea, but you know what the, the thing about bread is? Is it, um, it, it's one that from which we will hunger again. It's only good for so long, right? I mean, you, you have bread with your lunch and dinner comes around and you have dinner and you think, maybe I'd like to have some bread again. It just doesn't seem to hold us. It doesn't, I mean, sustain us for, forever. And it's bread that really satisfies the stomach. Bread is, it can be filling, you know? When we go out, like, maybe we'll go to some place like Cracker Barrel. Of course, there it's, it's, it's biscuits. 
we go somewhere for dinner, maybe they've got rolls. And I just find myself eating rolls because they're in front of me. I graze. And then all of a sudden my food gets there and I'm not hungry. Because why? Because I've eaten so much bread. And then I kind of skimp on my, on my, and I did this yesterday because it's like I, I, I ate my lunch and I was full and I had all this, this other food to eat and, and, um, and I didn't eat it. So I put it in the fridge for leftovers and then about, you know, maybe six o'clock last night, I'm like, boy, am I hungry. You know, I need to eat something. And what I had in the fridge had bread on it. So it was, I mean, it had a, had a bun, it was, it was a roll. So, but the idea there, it, it's good for the stomach, but it's only temporary. It only lasts for so long. Eventually, you're hungry again. Eventually, you find yourself wanting something to eat, something more. It is, the, the bread that we talk about is the bread that, um, it, it, it came to the work of the hands of man, to humanity. You know, you got the farmers who raise the, the, the grains, and you've got the, the, those who harvest, and then you've got those who bake, and those who pack up what is baked, and they will ship it out to the stores or whatever, and you go and you buy it. And there's this process, which is all a part of our economy, you know? But it's, it's done by man. Now, granted, God uh, uh, helps us in this. He supplies us with the knowledge and, and, and the seed and everything that's necessary to go ahead and create a harvest, but it's up to us to make it happen. If, if the farmer were to choose not to grow grain, we wouldn't have bread. It all rests on those individuals from, and, and that's all the way all the way through. What if what if the farmer went ahead and, and made the grain, but the baker decided they didn't want to bake bread? Or this or that, or the other, just the idea here of of the process. It takes hard work, it takes sacrifice to satisfy our physical hunger temporarily. If you've ever kind of thought about that, you know, we just go to the store and we look and of course we always kind of look and see what they've got there that's, you know, in organic or whatever. And we look at it and, and we pull one down and we try different ones over the years and stuff like that. And some are really good. Some taste like bread, like bread you think should taste and some taste like what you think cardboard should taste. But, but the idea there is, you know, everybody has those in the process have taken the time to do this and you take it home and you, you sit down and you eat it and you know, a couple hours later you want more, you're hungry, you're not satisfied. And I guess that's a good thing, right? Imagine if we only had to, if, we, if the only meal we ever had to eat, we ate when we were two years old. But that's not the way it works. We continue to, to go through this process and we, I, I thank God that he's given us that he supplied us with what is needed to keep us healthy, to keep us fed, you know? And, and even there now, you know, I've, I've kind of read through the things with, uh, with my cholesterol and, you know, the, the, the do's and don'ts of eating. And there's certain types of wheats and breads you can't eat, according to the, the doctors, right? You have to kind of figure that out for yourself. And so I have to kind of watch now what I eat. And it's not the intent of anyone that, that make, I don't believe, it's not the intent of the farmer to make something that, that would uh, be detrimental to our health, right? The, the intent is, of course, for them to make a living, but then to feed society. And so God has given them this, and through the, our processes, we found ways now of... Uh, Kind of probably changing things up from the way they did in Jesus' day, health wise. But it is through our work, each and every one of us, even those of us that go to the store to buy the bread. If we don't work, we can't afford bread, can we? There's a, the whole dynamic, the whole economy of this is, is, is a human concept, there's a human economy that exists. And it's a bread that sustains life. But there is another bread, and this is a bread that supplies life. And I think there is a difference here. Because whether you believe in Jesus Christ 
and you've accepted him as Savior or you haven't, there is a bread that will sustain you. The bread of the world. The bread that feeds us. And yet, Jesus says there is another bread. The bread that supplies life. It is a bread from which no one will hunger. Because we're not talking about the physical, we are now talking about a spiritual bread. A bread that has been given to us, a bread from heaven that satisfies the soul and the spirit. And, and again, as, I'm, I'm, as I was working through this, I thought to myself about the children of Israel as they were, as they were walking through the wilderness. They had a bread, that sustained, a bread from heaven that sustained them, the manna of heaven. And yet every day, they had to go out and harvest a day's worth of bread to sustain them, to keep them going. And yet now Jesus says, I am the bread from heaven, and in me you will no longer hunger. Because the hunger that we have, and I do believe that we all have this, uh, because we are created in God's image, and he has breathed his spirit into us, we have a spiritual hunger that is embedded in us, that we, that we desire something more than just what the physical has to offer. And I'm not, I mean, I, I'm looking at it from a Christian perspective here as, as a believer, but yet look at the world and look at the number of, of cults and false religions and doctrines that go out that seek to satisfy something in the spiritual, not the physical. Why do we desire that? Why do we strive after that? Why do we go for, look for that? Because it's ingrained in us. It's a part of who we are. It's created in the image of God. And yet there is only one bread from heaven that will satisfy that, and that is Jesus Christ. Because its results are eternal. They're not just for this moment and this hour, but they are something that will stay with us for generations to come. The, the, as long as we live, and, and when we die, and the generations that follow after us, we will continue to seek the bread that satisfies soul and spirit as long as Jesus tarries. But for those of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, we have this eternal result that we will never hunger and thirst for the presence of God. And one, one day in the future, we will experience in fullness that which we so long and desire. It is a bread that came not through the work of human, human hands, but through the work of our Savior, Jesus Christ. God made all the necessary preparations to satisfy our spiritual hunger. He sent his son as an infant in a manger in the little village of bread house of bread. This place that, that he had established, as Micah shows us, even before Jesus' birth, is that place from which the Savior would be born. That's what we celebrate as his birth. We don't celebrate Bethlehem, but we acknowledge the fact that this was a part of God's divine plan. Just as Jesus satisfying us eternally is a part of God's plan. He makes all the preparations to satisfy that spiritual hunger inside of us. And if you're, if you're seeking that satisfaction somewhere in the world, it's going to be temporary. It's not eternal. You may feel something for a while, but eventually you'll find yourself dissatisfied, seeking something else. And we can run to and fro. We can run here and there trying to satisfy what only God can do because we don't want to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And if that's you, then, then you're missing what the, the whole point behind the season. As I mentioned last week, we kind of watched the, uh, you know, well, we didn't watch, we watched both of the uh, Christmas, the, the Miracle on 34th Street Christmas um, movies here uh, over Thanksgiving weekend. And then the, the remake, I can, I, I, I'm always intrigued by the fact that the theme in the remake was I Believe. You know, they had their buttons, I Believe. You know, iron workers believe. You know, school kids believe. All these signs all over New York. Everybody believing. What are they believing in? Santa Claus. Right? Well, there's one in whom you must believe if you are to satisfy your spiritual hunger. And that's Jesus Christ. 
He is the bread of life. He has come to do the work of the Savior. It is bread that came through the work of Jesus Christ, and there is no other. It was up to God to supply what was needed. It's not going to come by the hands of man. It's not going to come by a, a preacher or a doctrine or a teaching. It can only come through Jesus Christ. As I mentioned in Sunday school this morning, it's scripture. It's our knowledge of the word of God and who Jesus is. The truth as the truth is presented by God that we accept. That we acknowledge it with our lives that satisfies that spiritual hunger. He accomplished all of it through his son. And without him, none of it is possible. From the most insignificant of places, Bethlehem, the house of bread, through the most insignificant of sources, a child in a manger, comes the greatest of gifts, the bread of life. Nobody sees anything in this little village that sits on, you know, outside of Jerusalem that's insignificant, the least of the house of the clan of Judah. Nobody sees anything in a child that's not born in a palace, but born in a manger. Surrounded not by royalty and celebration, but by hay and snowy animals. Not by kings and princes, but by shepherds, which will be what we'll talk about next week, the shepherds. Their role in all of this. Notice the insignificance of all of it. God's not about pomp and circumstance. He's about new life. And it's, it's not about cherry pie. I'll use that because that sounds good right about now. It's about a piece of bread, the bread of life. Jesus says it comes one of those big flashy desserts that it was a baked Alaska. It's like a little flame comes up on it or whatever. They light it up and it looks so fancy coming to the table, right? That's not God. God says, your desserts, you want to gain weight, eat nothing but dessert. But I've got something that sustains you and gives you life. It doesn't just sustain, it supplies. And this is what he has done through his son. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And he didn't do it, again, through, through banquets, but through the bread of life. So this morning, as we prepare to close, the question is, how do you view yourself in God's sight? Do you feel insignificant because you find yourself drawing comparison to others who are more gifted, better looking, or better off? We tend to do that, don't we? I don't think Jesus had an issue with, with uh, inferiority, with competition. There were those that the spiritual elites of his day that were educated in the things of God, right? They were the, 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 the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who knew everything inside out. And he never felt insignificant. And he also never fell into their trap. You see, he knew who he was in God. Do you know who you are in God? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior? Can you stand confident this morning that you have partaken of the bread of life and that there is a God who desires to sustain you no matter what you're going through right now? No matter what your situation? Let's remember God's greatest gift. And what comes from that? Let's, not, let's begin to look at the least likely of places. Let's not belittle ourselves, but let's humble ourselves before the Lord. I thank God that he took me, one of the most insignificant of individuals, and accepted me as a child of his. I just get this picture of, you know, uh, 
someone who wants to go in and adopt a child. And oftentimes, from what I've heard and seen, we've never adopted, but what I've heard and seen is when individuals, sometimes, most of the time, when people go to adopt, they're looking for something in particular. Maybe a boy or a girl, a certain age or whatever, maybe a certain eye color or hair color, or whatever, I don't know. Yet none of that mattered to God when he took me in. He said, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've done, and believe me, my resume is long. I just want you. And when I was a long way off, he came to me. And he accepted me as his. And he's done it for each and every one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. And since that day, the highs and the lows, the things that I've gone through, and many of them have gone through, and they are many, he has continued to sustain us, hasn't he? And if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, if you're, if you're listening online and you've never accepted him as Savior, he wants to bring you to him. He wants to come to you, and he wants to sustain you. But it begins by partaking of the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Accepting him as your Savior. That's what God has called us to do, each and every one. So as we close today, and as I pray, I pray that, that the Lord will speak to you. That the Lord will guide and direct you in all things. And that his hand will be upon you as well. So let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do. For who you are, what it means to be a child of yours. God, you have called us. unto you. And Lord, you have given us the greatest of gifts. But as it is with gifts, Lord, we have to be willing to accept it and receive it. We celebrate the birth of the Christ child. We celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Your greatest gift. And yet, Lord, there is a gift that's even greater that we can receive. If we would just receive the bread of life, you want to give us the gift of salvation. I pray, Lord, if there are any out there that have not received this gift, may your Holy Spirit speak to them, draw them unto you, that they would receive the gift of Jesus Christ. And for those of us that have, I pray, Lord, you continue to sustain us. Continue, Lord, to guide our paths, touch our spirits. Bless our souls, Lord. Be with us, I pray. And we give you praise and thanks. Go with us now and let us continue, Lord, as we to just rejoice in our celebration over these next few weeks as we continue to celebrate the birth of our Savior. Let us not get caught up, Lord, into the, the emotion and the excitement of the season and forget the reason for it. And Lord, if someone asks us, do you believe? We can say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Go with us, we pray, and keep your hand upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a really great week. As always, if you have an offering, you can drop it off in the basket up here, and that will be fine. Or if um, you want to give online, you can do so through our text to give option, or through uh, one of the other options that we have uh, through our Faith Life page. And if you follow us on Facebook, uh, our, if we have that, the sermon will be up on there later today. It'll also be on our website, so please feel free to share it with someone. And may God bless your week and be with you. God bless you all.